to the Mindful Cranks, where using your mind is not necessarily a bad thing, and where being cranky can actually be mindful. Let's crank it up. Well, thank you, uh, Evan, for uh, joining us in this conversation about your new book, Why I I Am Not a Buddhist. Uh, Thank you very much for coming on, and I've been wanting to talk to you for a long time. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. It's great to be here. So, you know, your your book starts out really uh, kind of autobiographical kind of an autobiographical account of a bit of your upbringing. And I, I really enjoyed reading about some of the your formative early influences you experienced growing up. And obviously, uh, you must have been quite precocious uh, starting Amherst, Amherst College at age 16 <laughs> and uh, studying with Bob Thurman. Um, I want to mention before we get into this that I was really a big fan of your father's work. Uh, oh, great. Nice. Uh, William Mer- yeah, William Irwin Thompson back. I remember reading his books in the 80s and early 90s. We, he actually turned me on to uh, studying uh, Gene Gebser. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. So maybe, um, can you begin by telling us a little bit about uh, living in Lindisfarne? Because I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. Yeah. And what influence Thurman had on your, let's say, your worldview, maybe your formation as a philosopher. Uh, I know that Bob's really big on uh, learning something. He always talks about, you know, let's use our intelligence and our critical reasoning. And I wonder if you could kind of tell us a little bit about all that. Yeah, yeah. So I I grew up uh, in the 1970s at an institute that was also a community or commune called the Lindisfarne Association, and it was founded by my parents, William Irwin Thompson and my mother, Gail Thompson. And it was in uh, Long Island, New York, Southampton, and also in Manhattan. And the idea of Lindisfarne was, so this was in the early 1970s. My dad was a, was a full professor of humanities at York University in Toronto, and he felt that the universities at that time were not providing the kind of uh, learning that was really needed for the kind of cultural civilizational uh, crises and transformations that that we were undergoing or that he perceived us to be undergoing. And so he quit his university position and he set up the Lindisfarne Association and it was a um, place that brought together scientists and um, religious spiritual teachers and artists, poets, uh, political activists, ecologists, environmentalists, all to address the need for a larger uh, ecological and planetary sensibility that was that was scientific and also was in dialogue or engagement with the world's religious traditions or the world's spiritual traditions. So as a result, I grew up around uh, a lot of you could say kind of counterculture alternative intellectual ideas and was exposed to a lot of different religious spiritual teachers. That was when I really first encountered um, living Buddhism, I suppose you could say. I had, you know, I had read some kid books about Buddhism. Um, My father uh, had, you know, told me about Buddhism, but really it was there at Lindisfarne that I first encountered living Buddhism in the form of Zen, I suppose you could say American Japanese Zen Buddhism. We, we had uh, connections to the San Francisco Zen Center. The abbot at that time was Richard Baker Roshi, and he sent some of his students to live with us and uh, to teach to teach Zen meditation. And they were in a context of other teachers from other traditions, you know, Christians and Sufis and uh, yogis. And so it was, you know, a, t- a typical kind of eclectic, syncretic 1970s mix. And uh, that's where I fir- first met Bob Thurman, Robert Thurman. He came to a conference my dad organized, I think it would have been 1976. And he came as a translator for two Tibetan Rinpoches, Nechung Rinpoche and Goming Kane Rinpoche, who actually later lived with us for about six weeks in our center in Manhattan. And I think Bob at that point had been maybe, I guess a couple of years he had been a professor at Amherst College. He was an assistant professor in the religion department at Amherst at that point. And 
that was um, when I first, I suppose, saw. Well, it was certainly when I first met Thurman, but it was also where I first saw the the way that um, that. Asian Buddhist teachers, especially, you know, Tibetans would, would speak and instruct in Tibetan and then, you know, Bob would be translating and then there would be the kind of back and forth dialogue with the audience. And that was really the first time I had seen that. And just that process itself of translational conversation across languages and cultures and belief systems, um, I found, you know, really fascinating. I, I was maybe, so I was about 13 then, 12 or 13. Um, and I, I was kind of captivated by that. And then um, Bob returned to Lindisfarne over the following couple of years, I guess, um, to give lectures at our center in Manhattan. So he gave lectures on the Vimalakirti Sutra, you know, very influential Mahayana Buddhist Sutra. Um, he gave some lectures called The Politics of Enlightenment, which I think later figured in one of his more popular books. And so, uh, you know, I, I got to know him a little bit and I, and I had always, you know, had an interest in things philosophical and I was especially drawn at that point as a teenager to Chinese philosophy and had gotten really interested in Taoism and thought that I wanted to, to learn Chinese and classical Chinese. And so when I was thinking about you know, where to go to college, my dad suggested that I go to Amherst, um, partly because we knew Bob and we had a connection and also because, you know, my dad had gone to Pomona as an undergraduate. So he, his orientation was very much, you know, go to a liberal arts college, have that kind of education. And so, uh, so I did, I, you know, I applied to Amherst and, and went off to study at Amherst and um, majored in Asian studies and, and, focused mostly on Chinese language and Chinese history, but but then Bob was on sabbatical my first year there. So this was 1979, 1980. And th- so I didn't study with him my first year, but then when he came back, I started taking his courses on Buddhism. And it was one course in particular that he taught that was actually a course in Indian philosophy, where we, we read a lot of classical Buddhist, Indian Buddhist philosophers like Nagarjuna and Vasubandhu and Dharmakirti, along with their um, Hindu Brahminical opponents or or you know debate partners i suppose you could say and i was just completely uh captivated by that bob bob presented all of these thinkers in a way that linked them to major figures in the history of western philosophy and he presented philosophy as a global or cross-cultural project of of learning and reasoning and analysis and that was actually really before I had taken philosophy courses in the philosophy department. And so when I started taking philosophy courses, I kind of went into it with this idea already that philosophy was inherently cross-cultural and should be a, you know, a global cosmopolitan conversation. And that really just affected me all the way forward. So, um, I, you know, I went on to graduate school in philosophy, got my PhD in philosophy, but my undergrad degree was in Asian studies. But it was really Bob who, in those early courses, shaped how I thought about philosophy and, and really how I still think about philosophy. So, I, you know, I really feel I owe that to him in terms of my own my own formation. Yeah, that's really fascinating. Um, and then, not. Well, shortly after that, well, actually, I, from, from when I read you, you knew Francisco Varela uh, quite well growing up, and uh, eventually uh, you found yourself uh, being part of the Mind and Life Institute. Uh, and you tell the story uh, that over time you you observed how critical voices were being ignored or minimized, uh, and not just in mind and life, but perhaps in the whole field of contemplative studies in general. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what what unfolded for you in, in terms of these concerns, and uh, and and maybe end with you know maybe that'll kind of culminate. Uh, in your thinking around what you call Buddhist exceptionalism. And I was wondering if you can elaborate on that. Yeah. So, um, so Francisco Varela, who is a, a neuroscientist and, and a, a Tibetan Buddhist, uh, was another person who came to Lindisfarne in the 1970s, uh, around the same time, a little bit later than Thurman. Um, and he lived with us as a scholar in residence. So he became a family friend and uh 
kind of a combination of mentor and uncle and older brother to me uh, in the period just before I went off to Amherst. And he he was a very innovative uh, biologist and neuroscientist, very philosophical scientist. And when I was in graduate school and had decided – I was in graduate school in philosophy and, and had decided to focus in the area of philosophy of mind and cognitive science, he was at that point – so this is now the mid-1980s, about 1986. He was um, – kind of pulling together lectures that he had given in different places over the years on Buddhism and cognitive science with the idea of turning them into a book. And he knew that, you know, I had my undergraduate training in Asian studies and had studied Buddhist philosophy with Bob. And now I was in grad school working in cognitive science and and philosophy of mind. And so he invited me to, uh, he had just moved to Paris and set up his lab in Paris. He invited me to come and be his research assistant to help him put together these um, these lecture texts into something that could then be written up as a book on on Buddhism, Buddhist philosophy, Buddhist meditation, and cognitive science. And as a result of that, um, I sort of moved from being a research assistant to a co-author with him on what eventually became the book, The Embodied Mind, which also has Eleanor Roche, who's a psychologist at Berkeley, as a co-author. She sort of joined the project in the like last year and a half of its completion. And this was, I, I think it's fair to say, this was the first academic book that, that really tried to relate Buddhist philosophy and Buddhist meditation to a Western um, scientific perspective on the mind. It was published in 1991, The the Embodied Mind. Francisco Varela was also the founding scientist of the Mind and Life Institute. The Mind and Life Institute, in its very early years when Francisco um, first started it, was really just a way of bringing scientists and uh, philosophers to Dharamsala to meet privately with the Dalai Lama to explore the relationship between science and Buddhism. And then when Francisco died in 2001, this was at the period where Mind and Life was just starting to um, try to bring that dialogue into a more public presentation. And that's really when I became involved with the Mind and Life Institute. I mean, I had heard about it all along from Francisco, but it didn't really have any direct involvement with it until after his death. And the the first big public meeting was at MIT in 2003. And that was, that was the first time I participated with the Mind and Life Institute. And then over the period of time from, say, 2003 until really about two years ago, I suppose, I worked um, in different ways with the Mind and Life Institute. I, I participated in a number of dialogues with the Dalai Lama in India. Um, I helped design the Mind and Life Summer Research Institute, which happens every year in Garrison, New York. It brings together scientists who are interested in researching contemplative practices with uh, Buddhist teachers and philosophers and um, historians of religion, anthropologists. And it's it's really in that milieu of the Mind and Life Summer Research Institute that I started to um, formulate the ideas that are now written up in the in the book Why I'm Not a Buddhist. And so the connection there to what I call Buddhist exceptionalism is that in the, in the context of the Mind and Life Summer Research Institute, my experience was that Buddhism was given a kind of special treatment. And at first, I simply took this for granted and didn't really think about it critically. Um, So the special treatment was to sort of present Buddhism as um, superior to other world religions, so-called world religions, or just superior to other religions in being inherently rational, inherently empirical, a better dialogue partner for science than, say, um, Hinduism or Christianity or, or Islam. And the scientists very much kind of addressed Buddhism that way, especially if they were scientists who also happened to be Buddhists. Um, A number of Buddhist teachers, meditation teachers, religious teachers, also Buddhist scholars, uh, not all of them, but some of them would present Buddhism this way. And at first, this was how I thought about Buddhism too. I, I kind of took this perspective for granted. And then the more and more that I learned about 
the history of Buddhism, especially the history of what scholars of religion call Buddhist modernism. So this is the version of Buddhism that originates in Asia in the 19th century, gets exported to the West, then imported back into Asia, where Buddhism is framed as more scientific, truly scientific than, say, Christianity. So this is formulated originally in a context of you know colonial asia where the where the um the asians are are uh you could say fighting back against the uh assertion of the superiority of christianity and of european civilization and of science and they're arguing back by saying they sort of turn the tables around by saying well no look buddhism is really the scientific religion because you know we don't need to believe in god and we believe in you know the law of cause and effect and um they they present meditation in a new way as a kind of direct personal experience of the nature of the mind so this was the kind of buddhism that you know I had taken for granted as just, you know, what Buddhism is. And then I realized that it's a particular kind of modernist construct. And when I started to study this in more detail, I realized that this language of Buddhist exceptionalism was based on ways of thinking about what religion is and what science is that are, that are problematic and that either exempt Buddhism from being a religion or present it as a special kind of religion. And in doing so, distort, I think, um, really what's at the heart and and at the core of of Buddhism. And so that's what I call Buddhist exceptionalism in the book. And the, the idea really is that Buddhist exceptionalism is part and parcel of Buddhist modernism. And my book is, you could say it's a philosophical critique of Buddhist modernism and the assumptions about science and religion on which Buddhist modernism rests. Yeah, I, I think we're really on the same page here because I've had the same concerns as well, especially um, when it comes to uh, neuroscience uh, and uh, that uh, they are making claims that uh, uh, I think you point out very well in the book that uh, Buddhist teachings are not empirical claims, but they're normative, they're soteriological, and that many Buddhist modernists uh, – People like Sam Harris, Stephen Batchelor, John Kabat-Zinn, and many others, they, they believe that they can lay claim to the Buddha's original message. What's wrong with this that kind of rhetoric, in your opinion? Yeah, so there's two things. Like somehow, right, yeah. Go ahead. No. Yeah. The, the, oh, go ahead. Okay, there's, there's, there's two things that you mentioned there. So one is, you could say, a kind of neuroscience, or I would even say neuroscientistic, because careful neuroscientists are much more careful about these kinds of things, but a kind of mm-hmm. neuroscientistic rhetoric um, that tries to legitimize Buddhism or meditation or Buddhist ideas by appealing to neuroscience. Um, so that's sort of one element in the in the in one version of Buddhist modernism, a kind of you know what some people call neuro Buddhism, a kind of you know neuroscienceized version of Buddhist modernism. That's one element in the mix. And then there's another element um, that we see, uh, which is the idea that uh, in being. Um, modern scientific Buddhists were were recovering, you know, the original kind of rational empirical message of of the Buddha. Um, often those two elements go together, but they don't always. So, you know, for example, I think, Stephen, you know, Stephen Batchelor, I think, uh, doesn't make the mistake of thinking that Buddhism isn't normative or soteriological. Um, and doesn't try to use science to legitimize Buddhism. I don't. I don't think that's his message at all. Um, and and there, I actually sympathize with him quite a bit. What Stephen does is that he he claims to be uncovering a kind of you know original Buddhism that was then corrupted by history and tradition. And there, I fundamentally disagree with him um, on the way that he you know reads history. So, um, so with regard to the kind of neuroscience eyesing of of Buddhism. Um, there, I think you know the the, the fundamental uh, message that I try to convey in the book is that that Buddhism is a but Buddhism makes value judgments. It's normative and it makes value judgments about 
um, things in relationship to an idea of transcendence, where, where transcendence is, you know, awakening, liberation, nirvana. And those are not, those are not scientific concepts. Um, they're like, you know, artistic concepts. You know, artists make claims about, or not make claims, but engage in practices that have to do with, you know, the beautiful or the terrible or the sublime. And those aren't scientific concepts. They're aesthetic ones. And, and they're valid and have power and meaning in their own domain. So similarly for normative and soteriological concepts. And so it's just kind of a confusion, a philosophical confusion, you could say, to try to mix them together or use one to legitimize the other. So that's that's one strand of argument that I go through in the book. And then with regard to the historical side of things, um, I mean, the, the fact of the matter is that we – don't have any direct concrete historical evidence about the Buddha as a, as a historical individual. What we know about the Buddha comes from literary texts that are at, you know, several removes from him. So they're originally orally preserved and subject to, you know, emendations and redactions and, and editing by those who remember them. And then eventually they come to be written down in a language the Buddha didn't speak at a place, you know, far from where he lived. So we have a, we have a very rich textual tradition with, with different understandings and interpretations of the Buddha's message. And the idea that we could somehow get outside of that tradition back behind it to know what the Buddha as a historical individual really thought and taught, mm-hmm. I think just uh, is impossible given the, the nature of the evidence available to us and, and just the nature of history, you could say, and the nature of, of a, of a evolving, um, evolving tradition. Um, so that's, that's the, the criticism I make of, of that move. And as I say, those are two different moves. Sometimes you'll see them, you know, combined, um, maybe, you know, maybe Sam Harris combines both of them. You know, Stephen, Stephen doesn't, um, he, he, he makes more the, the kind of, uh, historical, historical claim. I mean, Stephen, St- Stephen is a friend and, and I, I have great admiration for Stephen's work and I think he's actually a very sophisticated thinker. So sometimes he writes as if he's saying, well, this is just the interpretation that I would like to, you know, creatively develop for us here and now today. And I have no problem with that because that's how traditions evolve. It's this other thing he sometimes says, which is the idea that, you know, somehow the Buddhist tradition is corrupted and we're getting back to the like original inspiration or message of the Buddha. That I don't accept. And 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 that logic, I should point out, is the same logic we see in fundamentalism. Um, you know, Stephen is not a fundamentalist, yeah, yeah. of course, but that logic, no, let's get no. back to the original message, that's a fundamentalist move. And it's fundamentally something that we see in modernity. It, that, that's how modern people think. Yeah. I, I, I think that your, your book does a cr- terrific job of, of critiquing <clears throat> Buddhist modernism and also debunking a lot of that fundamentalism and, showing the historical a lot of that arose in the 19th century and and for me there's a puzzle that's kind of at the heart of your book maybe i'm i'm jumping the gun here we have so many other thing, things that we can talk about um if if we reject buddhist modernism and and we and we kind of don't want to go back to a fundamentalism which is in a way not there or not even impossible what what, what would you? Why can't you be a right. Buddhist without being a Buddhist modernism? I think that's one of the arguments that you make in your book. That's one of your, and 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 you do you do a terrific job of talking about what you call cosmopolitanism, which we already have a sense of from your from your background. You have you have a philosophical background. You're already kind of much broader than a Buddhist background. But but I'm really curious as to. What what would you say to people? Well, well, okay, we we can't we don't we don't like Buddhist modernism. We don't want to go to fundamentalism, but but there are hints in your book that suggest that there is a way. There's a kind of truer way that Buddhists can or need to be. That you could be a Buddhist without being either right, a fundamentalist. Right. So or a that's Buddhist in a way, modern. I suppose, what um, my hope for the book is is that by is that by giving a, a kind of philosophical critique of mm-hmm. Buddhist modernism, which is you know the most widespread and prevalent form of Buddhism transnationally and especially in the West outside of um, of either traditional monastic Buddhism or you could say Asian lay Buddhism, you know, the 
which is a different context, you know, whether it's in Thailand or China or something like that. Um, what, what I would say, my hope for the book is, is to um, encourage Buddhists, modern Buddhists, to reform Buddhist modernism or indeed to develop a kind of um, post-Buddhist uh, modernist Buddhism. Um, and, and that really requires, I think, um, dropping – some of the it, it requires dropping Buddhist exceptionalism, the idea that Buddhism is somehow a kind of rational and empirical, uh, in 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 the scientific sense of those words, um, uh, science of mind. Yeah, yeah. That it's a science of the mind, and that they really embrace um, the idea that Buddhism is a is a rich and sophisticated conceptual system with an ethical vision. Uh, at its heart. Yes. Now, of course, how the ethics plays out on the ground, people can disagree about that. But but the but that there's a there's a kind of normative, ethical, soteriological um, engine on which Buddhism is is running, and it distorts Buddhism to present that as uh, as somehow scientific or legitimizable by science. So my right. my book is in a way a plea, mm-hmm. uh, and I hope maybe an aid to Buddhists to help them think themselves out of this particular way that Buddhism came to be constructed in the late 19th century and then, you know, into the 20th and 21st centuries. Yeah, I, I almost see a sequel to it. <laughs> I was ready to see part two. You, know, it might be, you might already be working on that. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's not – in a way, like so, the, what I say in the book is that I I consider myself and I want to be a good friend to Buddhism. So I I consider what I'm doing as like in the spirit of friendly conversation, where you know a good friend is someone who says something like you know mm-hmm. you, you've been going around saying this and I, I don't really think it's in your interest to say this and I don't really think it's quite right. So that's kind of how I see what I'm doing. But then it's 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 really for those who who do identify as Buddhists mm-hmm. to. To decide, um, you know, what yeah. Buddhism is is going to be. That's like not in a way for me to say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in chapter two, um, is Buddhism true? Obviously, it's a critique of uh, Robert Wright's book, Why Buddhism Is True, which I'm really glad you did because I, I've also had major misgivings about Wright's take on Buddhism, especially uh, his psychologizing of of liberation. Uh, I think Wright claims that liberation is freedom from being uh, conditioned by craving, something that's uh, built into us by natural selection. Um, It's a really good chapter. And and So what did you find problematic uh, with Wright's view of Buddhism, number one, and liberation, number two? Yeah. um, So I should say, just because readers – not readers, but sorry, listeners might be interested in this. He he just interviewed me a couple of weeks ago for his podcast. Um, We had a great conversation. Oh, great. It was really fun. Yeah. So oh, that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna watch that. Yeah, it should be out. It, I don't think it's out yet, but but hopefully it'll be out. It'll be out soon. Um, um, oh, great. Yeah. So I mean, so what Wright does is, um, is he he uses a, a particular f- theoretical framework within science called evolutionary psychology to interpret and to and to justify what he considers to be the naturalistic elements of Buddhism. So, so his logic is, you know, there's Buddhism, um, which is this vast complex thing. There are ideas in it that we can kind of extract as um, a, a, a naturalistic core and then we can show how evolutionary psychology, um, you know, corroborates them or 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 justifies them. And so, in that mix is the idea that um, you know the human the human brain and mind have been formed um, under a history of uh, various kinds of evolutionary pressures, where as a result of natural selection, we um, behave in in ways that are, uh, uh, you know, strongly motivated by a kind of craving and and selfishness um, that's actually inconsistent in a way with with the logic of of evolution, um, and that Buddhism can help us to recognize this 
conditioned by craving in an, in, a, in an immediate experiential way so that we can then not be uh, conditioned by craving in our feeling and thinking and, you know, be, be better, more uh, pro-social, compassionate, um, compassionate human beings. So, I mean, there's a, there's a number this, of, but his reliance, go ahead. Yeah. His reliance on naturalism. Um, isn't he basically, uh, reifying biological reality, uh, as, as the ultimate He's avoiding social context. I mean, that's what you made that point. And, you know, maybe, maybe it's, maybe it's yeah. not natural selection. Maybe it's capitalism. Maybe it's the culture. Right. I mean, it's, right. There's a lot of problems. So, with evolutionary exactly. psychology. Right. So, so one level. But of I my, think there is this issue of re. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I think there's this issue of reification mm -hmm. uh, sure. in his in his thinking that I mean, because once you take biological reality as the ultimate ground, then you're basically into a mode of scientific materialism, aren't you? Where the mind is equated with the brain. Yeah. Yeah. So, right. So, so one one level of my disagreement with him has to do with evolutionary psychology um, as a as a useful framework here. So, uh, and and this disagreement actually is in a way um, separable from Buddhism because I, I simply thinking within the terms of cognitive science think that the evolutionary psychology framework is um, is defective. So, evolutionary psychologists um, have this idea that our minds were basically formed in the Stone Age. They they basically operate the same way as a result of of natural selection. And so, when they when they say those sorts of things, um, they ignore the huge influence of, of culture and um, learning. So that's, uh, I think, a, a, a real fundamental problem. They also have, a, I think, a view of the brain that um, treats it as made up of these kind of like special purpose cognitive devices that were, as it were, installed by natural selection, whereas uh, I think our best you know, work on the brain in neuroscience today um, doesn't support that view of the brain at all. Brain is a, you know, a complex uh, dynamical system that um, is very much uh, scaffolded and shaped by culture and language. Um, so there, you know, I have disagreements just on the scientific terrain on which he's operating. But then the way that it plays into the point about um, reification is that if you use that kind of framework for for looking at the mind, then you are um, you're according a kind of primacy to the biological level of the story to and and also to what i think of as a as a kind of distorted way of looking at the biology namely through evolutionary psychology but you're asserting a kind of primacy to the biology that ignores um the uh the the complex web of of language and culture and sociality and that way of looking at things you know downplays the um the cultural societal aspects of of human suffering so for example um you know he thinks that our problems are fundamentally a, a matter of natural selection whereas the problems he identifies you know craving and attachment are you know very much problems that are ramped up enormously in a consumerist capitalist society. So the idea that, you know, you, you're just going to get a view of, of the problem by looking at the biology, I think is, um, is, is, is naive. And, and this also connects back to the point, you know, uh, a little while ago where we were talking about, you know, well, how could Buddhism evolve and become different? Well, I think one thing that Buddhism has that's 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 really an important contribution is its philosophical intellectual tradition and in its philosophical intellectual tradition there's very sophisticated thinking about how the mind can't be reduced to any one element or to any one kind of substance or to any one level of analysis that um that it has to be seen relationally and interactively and so a, a kind of you know reification of the primacy of the brain would would be called into question by by buddhist philosophical thinking and that's where in the buddhism science dialogue it's very important to not try to use the science to justify buddhism but actually to use the resources of buddhist philosophy to help us think better about um what 
uh, you know, the, 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 the scientific, um, you know, data uh, actually, actually are suggesting. But, but would you say that, that it, whether it's in mind and life or elsewhere, that there are uh, Buddhists that would, that would still cling to that, especially the ones that dialogue with the scientists that, that, that are, are seeking the kind of materialist or neural substrate of, of, of the self? I guess we're moving into the next chapter, but... I think it depends on who you ask. I think that there's there you know there's there's a sort of spectrum or range of different views. And if you um, if you look at the you know the different scientific voices um, that say have participated in the Mind and Life Summer Research Institute or the Mind and Life Dialogues, um, you know sometimes y- you'll you'll see statements like, "Well, we can really identify." Um, self-identification with the activation of, you know, this brain structure, for example, you know, sometimes claims like that are made, but, um, most neuroscientists are going to have a problem with a statement like that, um, because they know that, you know, the brain is a complex system and you can't just sort of superimpose complex constructs like the self onto like a particular area. Um, I'd say it's more at a level of a kind of rhetoric where the, um, the, the framework of thinking is one where we think that the Buddhist ideas are somehow um, – how do I want to put this? That, 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 that somehow they are um, not inherently – Let's, let's use the word religion, that they're not inherently religious and therefore they can be given a scientific cast. Whereas if someone, you know, if someone came in and started using a, frame, a framework for talking about the mind that comes from Thomas Aquinas and then tried to map it onto neuroscience, everybody would sort of scratch their head and go, well, this is kind of weird. Um, what's going on here? Yeah. must be a Christian <laughs> apologist of some kind. But if – a scientist or a Buddhist comes in and says, well, you know, here's the Abhidharma model of the mind and now I'm going to map it onto neuroscience. People don't, you know, they don't balk at that at all. Cause, and cause, and that, no that's God, an right? example of like, right, because they think there's, you know, because there's no God, it doesn't, you know, it, it changes the game. But that's like a red herring. It's not about whether there's a God or not. It's about the nature of the conceptual system and the context in which it was originally formulated. So that's an example of Buddhist exceptionalism, how it sort of operates on the ground. And then, you know, historians and anthropologists, for example, in the, you know, in the Mind and Life Summer Research Institute, when we would have these conversations, historians, anthropologists, scholars of religion would, would make the very point I'm just making. And Mm -hmm. it would, it would meet with a fair amount of resistance, I think. Um, Yeah, I've heard that. I've heard that too. too, You know? Yeah. (laughs) You know, the, the other point before we leave this thing with Wright, um, and it's, it goes beyond just Robert Wright, uh, is that, you know, I think there's a conflation with, let's say, uh, our clinical uh, psychological understanding of mindfulness. Uh, I think there's a conflation with uh, Buddhist philosophy and Buddhist practice because, um, you know, it seems like nirvana uh, or awakening is psychologized and 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 reduced to uh, to uh, a state, a psychological state of well-being. Sometimes they refer to it as human flourishing. Uh, and I think you make a really good point that there's a huge difference between the unconditioned and the deconditioned. Can you talk to that point of just just a little? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's one of the one of the moves of so-called naturalistic Buddhism, which is to try to naturalize the notion of nirvana, um, which is traditionally said to be the the unconditioned. And what what unconditioned means is that um, it's not the result of a cause, and it's it's not you know made up um, by being put together out of other elements. It's neither conditioned nor compounded. So nirvana is said to be the unconditioned, and it's the only thing that is, you know, truly peaceful. Uh, to, you know, to 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 think of it um, in the in the classical Buddhist way. 
And so the attempt to naturalize that is to render it as, and, and this is, for example, what Wright does, is to render it as a kind of not being conditioned by craving or not being conditioned by negative emotion. So that's what I call a kind of deconditioning. And, uh, you know, I mean, to be to be somewhat blunt, we it's not as if we need Buddhism for that, right? I mean, we know... It, common sense that, you know, if you're under the undue influence of craving or emotions, um, you're not going to see things clearly. So, well, cognitive you know, behavioral therapy does yeah, that too. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, or psychoanalysis. I mean, there's like all sorts of places where we could get that message, right? Um, that doesn't invalidate the message. It's just to say that it's not, that's not an, an especially, uh, you know. Not very radical. Yeah, uh, it's not a distinctive Buddhist idea. So, so I think that um, that uh, one of the problems with naturalistic Buddhism is that it doesn't confront the serious conundrums and paradoxes that come from the notion of nirvana as a soteriological notion. Because if nirvana is the unconditioned, then it can't be the result of any cause – it can't be put together or made up of other things. So then the question is, well, how does one attain it and what exactly does it mean to attain it? I mean, traditionally, it said, you know, nirvana is the fruition of, you know, following the Eightfold Path. But there's another sense in which it can't, it can't be defined that way because it's the unconditioned and anything that's a result of following a path is something, is something conditioned. So you know, Buddhism has grappled with this conundrum since the very beginning and and different buddhist traditions and different buddhist thinkers and you know say different things in response to it so you know one example is the unconditioned isn't anything positive it's something purely negative it it's what it's what is there when the causes of craving have completely ceased so it's a cessation it's not it's not something positive um, you know, other traditions try to say, you know, well, it's no different from the condition. There's a non-duality of conditioned and unconditioned. So my point here isn't that, you know, there's any one right answer to that question. I think it's a deep, deep question that arises from the, the normative soteriological heart of the concept. And to, um, to either ignore that or not see it or try to flatten it out into an idea of a sort of psychological deconditioning um, seems to me to, in a way, not really be, be, be grappling with what the Buddhist tradition most fundamentally is about. Yeah, I agree with you completely. I, I mean, what comes to mind is uh, the Prajna Paramita, the Diamond Sutra, all these kinds of really, really ontological, radical sort of emptiness teachings that, you know, the whole debate between gradual versus sudden enlightenment. I mean, it, you're right. It's just, just a vast corpus of mm -hmm. debates and commentaries on this very subject that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I wonder if we could turn our critique a little bit towards mindfulness uh, chapter four in your book, The Mindfulness uh, Mania. Um, you say, or you make the point, there are two fundamentally misguided ideas that you write about. One, that mindfulness is a method for something that's always, I think, bothered David and I, and I too, a method for objectively observing almost like a private theater of the mind. Uh, and, and two, that the best way to understand the effects of mindfulness is to study the changes in the brain. Mm -hmm. So can you speak to these two right. misconceptions? Yeah. So, so there I think what we have are two ideas that are um, – they're distinct, but they're often linked. And they reinforce what I would call a kind of um, individualist or internalist way of thinking about mindfulness. So one idea is to think that what mindfulness is, is private inner introspection, where what you're doing is you're um, taking the, the, the mental capacity of, of inner awareness and you're using it to watch or to scrutinize or to examine 
what is happening inside the mind. So an example, I mean, a, sorry, a, an analogy that um, that some people use is it's like, well, um, a kind of inner telescope, you know, you're, you're using a kind of inner magnif- magnifying instrument to observe what's happening inside the mind. Um, now, I have, I have several problems with that. So, so one is the analogy of a telescope or a magnifying glass is a kind of instrumentalist analogy. So when you think of your relationship to your own mind in that way, you are in effect instrumentalizing your relationship to yourself. You're, you're sort of reifying, you could say, or objectifying your own subjectivity. So that's that's. I think actually to yeah, there's kind of a split. A, it's kind of a dualist split. Right, right, exactly. So you miss in a way what's most uh, fundamental in a way about the mind, which is that it always escapes that that kind of uh, objectification when you when you sort of use that analogy. So so that's one point. But then there's another another aspect to this point, which is that. Um, if we're thinking about mindfulness in the sense of, you know, what what uh, say John Donne calls classical mindfulness, so he distinguishes between, you know, kind of classical mindfulness of the sort we might see in the Satipatthana Sutta, and then what he calls non-dual mindfulness, which we see in, you know, maybe Mahamudra and Dzogchen and and you know Chan or Zen. Um, but if we're thinking about classical mindfulness, um, where the idea is very much a kind of um, monitoring and surveying and holding in mind and keeping track of um, what the object of attention is in a way that um, that evaluates it as positive or negative. All of that cognitive work from a cognitive science perspective is an internalization of social cognition. In other words, the, the processes or the systems or the capacities by which the human mind is able to do that is something that originates developmentally, socially, where we learn to monitor each other's behavior and we, we come to understand ourselves as a self in relationship to an other and we can take up a kind of observational perspective on ourselves. That all happens. That's all formed through um, social cognition and then it's internalized developmentally. So when we engage in a practice like mindfulness, we are already fundamentally in the domain of social cognition, even when it's just you know, sitting on your own cushion and, and kind of watching, as we say, the mind, you know, or, uh, thoughts arise and pass away. It's, it's socially um, constructed. It's not simply uh, seeing things as they are, which is one of those myths. that, that Exactly. You, you exactly. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And so then, yeah, to, to, to build on the point you just made there, then if you, um, if you think about, okay, uh, I'm going to engage in this kind of practice and you're using a conceptual system. Like if you read the Satipatthana Sutta, there's this elaborate, you know, Buddhist conceptual system of the aggregates and the dharmas. And the idea is you're supposed to know that conceptual system and you're supposed to use it to categorize and track everything that's happening in the field of your awareness. So that's highly conceptually mediated and conceptually structured. And, um, it's, Absolutely, it's, yeah, it's so, doctrinal, kind of uh, contextual. Exactly. exactly. Uh, so this is this is just a way of pointing out the kind of rich social, conceptual milieu of the practice. Then the relationship to the brain is that um, scientists and um, and Buddhists who are you know drawn to scientific discourse will often say things like. Um, well, when you practice mindfulness, you change your brain or you train your brain, and the way to really see and understand what mindfulness is and what its effects are is to look at you know these plastic brain changes. And there, um, first of all, we have to say anything you do changes your brain. You know, you you drink a cup of coffee, it changes your brain. You ride a bicycle, it changes your brain. Your brain is always changing. So the idea that something changes your brain is totally trivial and uninteresting. Um, the yeah. idea that it changes your brain for the better, maybe, but the evidence, you know, uh, is still tentative on that. Um, and then thirdly, the idea that you would you would somehow understand what mindfulness is by looking at the brain is to confuse the the levels of um, of of discourse. So the analogy I use in the book is, you know, suppose that we take Yo-Yo Ma and we um, 
image his brain while he's playing box cello suite number one? Well, it stands to reason his brain is going to look very different from someone who doesn't know how to play the cello or who's an amateur player because he's an expert and he's devoted his life to the practice. That's not, you know, particularly interesting in and of itself. Moreover, the idea that looking at his brain would help us understand what music is or what cello is or what Bach is, is just confused. I mean, you can't understand those things without knowing about history and tradition and communities and practice. And, so it's and, the same. And, and, it's the same. And music. Like, yeah. And yeah, and exactly. That's right. That's right. Um, so, so that's all part of an argument to say that, of course, you need a brain to engage in any of these things. And understanding how the brain works is absolutely important. And we should try to learn more and more about that. So I have no argument with um, investigating uh, investigating the brain. What I what I argue against is a way of um, projecting things like. The, the the capacities of attention or metacognition or meta awareness that that make up mindfulness projecting them superimposing them onto what's going on in the brain it's a, to use another analogy i like to use it's like saying that flight happens inside the wings of a bird it's a, no you know you need wings to fly but flight is a relationship between the whole animal and its environment and what the wings do is they generate lift but the flight isn't inside the wings so yeah. Well, I think that's exactly right. And that's that's really, you know, the critique that I that I've also have engaged in. It's kind of a privatized, uh, in, as you say, internalist view that mindfulness is all in the head. And for that matter, the discourse has also been around that stress is also also. All, right. all inside our heads too, which I think is also problematic. It's a biological reductionist view of stress. Uh, right. You know, I think that uh, 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 you have a very ambitious chapter, the rhetorics of enlightenment. It's very ambitious. <laughs> I don't think we have time to, to dive totally into it. Uh, but it's been my observation, at least, that many uh, uh, secular Buddhists and many Western Buddhists, for that matter, uh, certainly many mindfulness teachers, practi- practitioners, uh, if, I think they, I feel like they've given up in a way on the Buddhist potential for full existential enlightenment or awakening. You know, I mentioned it before that you know, with positive psychology. And, you know, I hear I hear a lot about human flourishing as if that's equivalent to Buddhist awakening or enlightenment, or they talk about dropping into the being mode or living in the present moment as the pinnacle of maybe that's the pinnacle of the Buddhist modernist form of enlightenment. I don't know, but uh, uh, you do a really eloquent job, I think, of writing about that. Even within Buddhist traditions, uh, there is no consensus uh, across Buddhist schools of what enlightenment is or what it means, nirvana. Uh, but what is in common, uh, correct me if, if I'm wrong, is that it's about meaning. And can you elaborate on this whole can of worms here? Uh, it's a big question. but <laughs> Yeah. So, so, the, so I guess if I were to try to summarize the main idea of that chapter, the, what, the one called the rhetoric of enlightenment, it's, it's that – um, enlightenment or awakening, and, and many Buddhists, I think, would disagree with me on this, not just Buddhist modernists, um, that enlightenment or awakening is a concept, not a state. Yeah. Or, so what I mean by that… Would you say it's a metaphor? I, th- I think you use that. You could say it's a metaphor. You could yeah. say it's a metaphor. Yeah, it's a conceptual metaphor. Awakening is obviously a metaphor. Enlightenment is obviously a, a metaphor as well. Yeah. So… Um, the idea that there is a state that is the referent of the word awakening or enlightenment um, raises the question of, well, what is the state exactly? And then if you go to the Buddhist tradition, well, you could say by definition it's the realization of nirvana. But then if you ask what that is, then the, you know there there is no – one answer. Uh, all the way back to the very beginning, in the er- in the earliest suttas, we already see different conceptions of what this state is. It, is it a richly structured cognitive insight that you know is uh, encapsulated in the four noble truths, um, or is it a kind of ineffable, non-conceptual cessation of mental activity? Is it a shutting down of the body and mind in this life, like what happens at death, but um, but 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 not biological death? Um, is it the, the disclosing of an innate Buddha nature? You know, uh, Buddhism contains innumerably many uh, ways of thinking about 
or you could say of elaborating what the metaphor or concept of awakening or, or enlightenment is, all the way up to Buddhist modernism, where, as you say, we, we see an attempt to, um, to naturalize it or render it palatable to a modern sensibility that is, that is skeptical of any idea of transcendence that doesn't that's uncomfortable with any idea of transcendence. And so we see attempts to, you know, restate the idea as, well, it's some kind of eudaimonia or it's some kind of flourishing. Um, now, I mean, I have no, I have no objection to any of this in, in the sense that this is, this is what religions or philosophies do. They have rich concepts that are subject to multiple interpretations. They evolve over millennia. Um, what I object to is the rhetoric that denies that, that, that really thinks that, oh, you know, there is such a thing as enlightenment and we could have a scientific, you know, specification of what it is, or everybody, you know, could come to some agreement as to what it is. I think that, um, you know, I, 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 I quote Kant, you know, when he's talking about the European enlightenment, who says, um, the European enlightenment is about thinking for yourself. You know, Kant says, dare to be wise, you know, try to figure things out for yourself. So if, you know, if you want to be modern um, or modernist, then in some sense, you're going to embrace some version of that idea, which means you can't fall back on this rhetoric of, of thinking that, you know, enlightenment is this um, thing that, uh, that doesn't have any ambiguity or isn't subject to, you know, some task of, of interpretation, especially, you know, thinking that you could f- identify it in terms of the brain, which I think is, again, you know, a kind of confusion. Yeah, I, I, I remember a paper that came to mind as I was as I was reading your chapter that came out a while back, actually, uh, by David uh, Vago and Jake Davis. It, uh, I think it's a classic yeah. case of... Uh, I know that of paper, what yeah. you're referring to is, yeah, neural Buddhism. The I think it was can enlightenment be traced to specific neural correlates, cognition, or behavior? Right. Um, but that seems like a, a a good example of that. The other thing that you bring up, uh, I'm really glad that you did, is that uh, I think you raised some really important points regarding the tendency towards universalism. And in a way, kind of, you don't say this in the book, but I, kind of the appeal to perennialism among Buddhist modernists. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, when contemporary mindfulness teachers lay claim that they teach a universal dharma, uh, the downplay of tradition, dis- the, kind of a dismissal, mm-hmm. almost kind of a dismissal of, of the tra- tra- tradition as just cultural baggage and rituals and superstitions and dogma and metaphysical beliefs and all that um, and I, I really enjoyed when you talked about the role of faith uh, and uh, can you say something about that and how it yeah. relates to this discussion yeah so this this connects in a way back to this point about Buddhist exceptionalism you know when when people say oh you know in Buddhism, you don't need faith, um, and and Buddhist teachers will say this. I you know I quote an, um, examples of this uh, uh, in the book. You know, Buddhist teachers will say, you know, well, Buddhism isn't about faith. You don't need faith to be a Buddhist. Um, this I th- I mean I think this is just fundamentally uh, wrong. I think that um, you know historically, for the vast majority of Buddhists not just lay, you know, sort of, you know, lay non-intellectual Buddhists, but also for intellectual Buddhists, um, faith is essential because you have to have faith in the sense of trust or confidence in the word of the Buddha. You have to have, you know, faith that there, that there is such a thing as the unconditioned or there is the realization of nirvana. Um, and so the idea that, you know, uh, that faith is somehow not present in Buddhism, and that makes Buddhism say superior to Christianity because Christianity requires faith. I mean, that's I think that that's just um, incredibly superficial and 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 mistaken. Um, now, you also do sometimes see that linked to the kind of perennialist move that that you were just making where where people will link them so that you know the idea is that there's a kind of universal dharma um and we it's about practice meditation direct experience and you don't need faith you just you just need practice uh that isn't a universal that's a particular viewpoint that is 
uh, you know, a particular modernist viewpoint that is that is problematic for the reasons I go into in the book. So the universalism is again kind of rhetoric. And this 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 sort of privileging or uh, this idea of uh, a direct experience or uh, non conceptual non conceptuality. Do you think that has a, a role to play in, in why Western uh, Buddhist and Western Buddhism has become so anti-intellectual? I think so. I think I think that that has to do, you know. So Buddhist modernism is this kind of complicated entity with multiple strands, and so you know we, we've been talking mostly about the kind of like scientific strand in this conversation, but there's another strand which really has to do with um, the influence, historically speaking, of of European ideas coming out of Romanticism and, you know, American transcendentalism, Thoreau and Emerson, um, William James, you know, it gets taken up, especially in Zen. So, so, you know, writers like Nishida and DT Suzuki, they tend to go for a kind of um, romanticist, transcendentalist version of modernism, where the idea is that Buddhism is a path to the realization of a of an ineffable non-conceptual transcendent or or suchness you know the word suchness is sometimes used there and so that's a, a, a kind of modernist a different version of modernism that that um i think uh leads or has led very much to a kind of uh anti-intellectualism that uh, that you know downplays the importance of critical thinking and conceptual thinking, and uh, that's that's another element in the mix. You know, I mention that in the book. I don't talk about it as much in the book, but it's definitely there. And I certainly, you know, like growing up, I certainly saw this, um, you know, play itself out. Um, who, who, who was it with in, spiritual in the book? Was, was it was it Alan Wallace? Oh, or, like um, I mentioned. You know, when somebody uh, said, not well, so much Alan, I mentioned like DT Suzuki. But, but, but um, in, in, in the book, you said it was one of the in the earlier chapters, you said, uh, well, if you haven't experienced it, you have no right to critique it, which Ron and I. Oh, often yeah, that is Alan. Against yeah. people. And, that is and, Alan. You know, that, that, that's that's, to, right. that's to me is outrageous anti intellectualism. You know, you have to. You can't, yeah, no, you that, can't that, talk that about is it. Something unless, you know, it's just an, another example of that, yeah. Right, right. No, Alan. Alan did. Alan has, you know, said that. Uh, I mean, Alan's Alan's version of that is is um, meditation or contemplative practices in inner science. And yeah. just as scientists don't take, you know, the statements of non scientists seriously, so you know, inner contemplative scientists don't take the statements of non contemplatives um, yeah. as authoritative or seriously. Yeah, and I mean, that is a kind of, I think. Yeah, anti intellectualism. Um, I mean, the analogy I use in the book is you, you know, imagine if a psychoanalyst said, right, right. Um, you Which know, we don't do. take critiques of anyone who hasn't gone through analysis well, seriously. Some it's do. Like, well, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know some do say that. No, I realize that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I know. But especially, especially, uh, in the 20th century, mid 20th century, that would be yeah. something common to hear. Uh, maybe less so today, but but of course they do say that. Yeah, I, I just wanted to underscore a couple of points in your book that I, I find so important, and and that again, Ron and I often come up against them. One one is that I, it's, I feel like I have to keep telling people that that um, you, you know, there's anything changes the brain. It's like it's like there's there's so much hype, yeah. you know, in in in, in, the, in public writing that that oh, you know, you, you meditate and you changes your brain. You know, it's like it just because it's like talk about anti intellectualism, but but that's so important to, 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 to for people to realize that it's not it's not simply yeah. meditation. That's the, and and the other one which which I um I cited you in my book, not 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 in this not of this book which came out after mine, but. But the idea that there's no one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, neurological um, activity and, and and complex social activity, a complex uh, social right. behavior. I mean, it's just you know, and there, that's, that's another right. myth that drives a lot of uh, maybe a lot of research money. I don't know. Like they keep trying. Yeah, to yeah. yeah. You get you give a really good analogy of parenting. I yeah. use that too. That was really great. I think that analogy of parenting that you bring up in the book. Uh, Really illustrates and, and, point. and the other right, point exactly. about going back to enlightenment, you make the point about, you know, you ask the question. I mean, it's not so rhetorical. You know, can, can a sexual predator have, be enlightened? You know, I mean, obviously, we know the whole history of, of a number of of Zen uh, or of Buddhist uh, uh, 
you know, directors of centers that, that have been, mm-hmm. uh, have trouble with, with, you know, being, being sexual predators. And, and, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, I, I, I find what I find useful is the notion of at least not just having a state of enlightenment, you know, a state of contemplative awareness, but, but again, as your, your point is that, that there's a, a complex, uh, a cultural, um, context that, 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 as you say, orchestrates, uh, you know, the, the, right. the processes of, of meditation and mindfulness that we have to look at those very, um, cultural contexts, which, which, uh, you know, a number of us uh, are, are trying to spell out. Right. Right. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, that was something that, you know, uh, was, was also very apparent to me just growing up, you know, in the seventies and around a lot of different, um, communities and, you know, so-called charismatic, you know, religious teachers, many of them yeah. Buddhists, but others too, of course, obviously. And the, the kind of, um, predatory behavior and, and, and I don't know what to call it, just, you know, dysfunctional, uh, human interaction, um, that, that goes together with the anti-intellectualism and the, and the, and the, and the kind of rhetoric of, of, you know, uh, non-conceptual direct you know intuitive realization um i mean that that stuff was just rampant when i was growing up um yeah so in in the last chapter of your book um you talk a lot about varela uh you come back to talking a lot about varela's uh contribution again and you start out by uh talking about the Mind and Nature Conference back in 77, 1977. Uh, you were 15 years old. And uh, um, can you talk a bit about what did Varela mean when he uh, used this terminology, experimental epistemology? Mm-hmm. How, how, how do you understand that? Yeah, so he um, – so, so Varela, again, was a neurobiologist and um, – Someone who is who is really interested in the relationship between the brain and the mind, or or you know bio, the biology of the whole organism, but especially the brain and and the mind, and that he thought of his work as experimental epistemology in the sense that he wanted to understand cognition and knowledge, perception, but he wanted to understand it through the perspective of an experimental scientist. And the term experimental epistemology came from a very important founding figure of cognitive science uh, who worked at MIT named Warren McCulloch. And uh, Varela's mentor, Umberto Maturana, had worked with McCulloch. So there was kind of a scientific lineage of people who had worked uh, in this area of experimental epistemology, studying uh, experimentally, you know how visual perception works. For example, that was that was Varela's initial training, and so in in this lecture that he gave at Lindisfarne in Manhattan in ni- in the nineteen seventies, one of the early one of his early attempts to relate his his work as a scientist to his his practice as a Buddhist and to his study of Buddhist philosophy. The way that he did that was by saying, well, there are lineages in science and there are lineages in Buddhism and my lineage in science is experimental epistemology, neurobiology, um, the study of perception. And my lineage in Buddhism is Tibetan Kagyu Buddhism. And that's very informed by you know the Indian scholastic philosophy. And he had been reading and studying Vasubandhu at that point. So he was very interested in the idea that you could have um, a, a dialogue between Buddhism and science in which you might find an idea in, say, Buddhist practice and thinking. And for him, the idea that he was particularly interested in at that point was the idea that experience has a kind of discrete and momentary structure so that, you know, it might seem that, you know, perception and consciousness and thought sort of flow continuously and smoothly. But if you examine it in a more refined way, um, you could say meditatively, but you could also say using, you know, the right conceptual philosophical tools, which for Vasubandhu would be the, you know, the Abhidharma Buddhist system, that you would actually come to realize that experience is discrete and momentary. And he thought, well, that's a very interesting idea. How would a neuroscientist today investigate that idea? And he 
devised a very clever experiment uh, in which I was actually a, a subject that looked at um, how the way that you perceive things in time depends on what sort of momentary state the brain is in, and, and he was determining that through uh, electrophysiological measures, and the brain kind of transitions in a, in a, you could say, a rhythmic way with discontinuities from one state to the, to the next, and what you will perceive, even if it's sort of objectively sa- the same in the environment, will differ depending on which momentary state you're in, and so he thought, well, that's a way that the neuroscience neuroscientists today could work with this idea of of what in Abhidharma would be called mind moments or the momentariness of mind. And I, I go into all this because I say, well, this is actually a very different way of thinking about the Buddhism science dialogue from a lot of what we see today. A lot of what we see today is, you know, use neuroscience to justify some idea in Buddhism or um, you use neuroscience or Buddhism to, you know, embellish each other. Varela already in this lecture had sort of called attention to these extremes of embellishment and justification. And and this was during the time when this was happening mainly in relationship to research on TM, actually, not relation, mm-hmm. this is 1970s, not research on Buddhism. So it was very present on, on his part, right? And so his idea was, no, a dialogue between these two traditions is one that operates not by like examining meditation as an object of study, but rather by looking at different views of the mind and using a Buddhist ideas to inspire new kinds of scientific research, not about meditation, but just simply about how perception works. And then maybe using the neuroscience findings to um, reflect back on the Buddhist ideas, and that was the that was the attitude very much he originally started the mind and life dialogue yeah. with was was that approach. Yeah, yeah, I really like that, and uh, yeah, you used the example of the Tao of physics as uh, an example of the embellishment approach too. Right. I, I've often wondered, uh, I've often speculated. It, it may sound a bit cynical, but I, 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 I've often speculated whether academic research on mindfulness among. Uh, uh, clinicians and and scientists is really more of a missionary enterprise uh, to justify and promote mindfulness. But that's another that's another conversation. Well, well there's um, this, there's the soteriology. I mean, they you know they they they're believers. They they want to you know help the world. I think. I mean, I think that that's an element. It's an element in the mix, but I think it's I think it's a complicated situation. I mean, we could have a whole yeah. other, as you say, discussion yeah. about that. But I mean, I think some of it. Um, you know, I know you've been very critical of of a lot of uh, you, Ron, have been very critical of a lot of you know John Kabat Zinn's um, statements, um, but but you know I, I, I and I agree with some of those criticisms. I you know I think the situation is complicated by I, you know I think a lot of that work in mindfulness based stress reduction or mindfulness based cognitive therapy was was really motivated by you know by trying to help people who you know were, were suffering quite a bit. And it came from people who, of course, were, you know, committed to these, um, you could say, you know, religions or, or spiritual worldviews, and they're scientists, and they naturally want to try to, you know, um, justify one. And that's an element in the mix for sure. But I also think that a lot of the, a lot of the work is, is driven just by, you know, um, good, good aspirations of, of people wanting to, to, to help other people, the, the the difficulty, of course, is that, especially in the United States, is that you know the the entire social edifice of the you know biomedical system is is driven by uh, you know a kind of capitalist value system that you know uh, if one's working within you know there's it, one has to work within it. What is one going to do? So anyway, I you know I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Yeah. Just to say it's a complicated. No, no, that's complicated. <laughs> But I want to come back to this this dialogue issue of dialogue, so-called dialogue or conversation between Buddhism and science. A friend of mine who you probably know is uh, Linda Human, actually, uh, 
also wrote a paper that, you know, uh, almost saying the same thing that you're saying in some ways that we really haven't had uh, uh, an equal dialogue uh, because of this whole bracketing thing uh, that uh, uh, that happens, uh, the things that are off the table. And it, it seems like to me the things that are off the table are the very things that can be most useful to uh, uh, having, uh, you know, like what Varela did. Mm-hmm. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, there are different kinds of conversations. So I think a full no holds barred, as it were, conversation requires that uh, that certain things that are central to Buddhism not be bracketed uh, because they are what are necessary <clears throat> in a way to really reflect back and think critically about science as a human activity and to think about the ethics of science and um if we if we bracket out the kind of you know inner soteriological logic of buddhism then and and the worldview that it you know that it brings with brings with that then uh it's not really possible to have a full a full dialogue about those things in other words it's a dialogue where basically you're already saying well we're only really going to talk about the uh aspects that we can understand in scientific terms the the things that we can make intelligible given the present state of um of scientific thinking and, and scientific practice and so anything that's larger than that uh, we're not going to talk about now. I mean, that's that's useful at, for some purposes. Obviously, if you want to talk about the fine points of theories of perception uh, in Buddhist epistemology and neuroscience, well, then you know some larger soteriological themes or ideas may not be immediately relevant. But if you want to have a full conversation where the Buddhist also gets to challenge the scientist. Um, then it's important that those things that those things not be bracketed. Yeah, yeah. I think especially when you're trying to talk about the nature of mind, that uh, I mean, just I mean, uh, the city's extra extraordinary uh, human ability, psychic phenomena, past lives. I mean, uh, I think David Presty uh, wrote a really a really good book about this. That I think he was sharing the same the same concerns that you have. Uh, uh, I think Jeff Kripal, Kripal, he wrote a book, The Flip. It was right. I've also read getting into this yeah. too. I've read those books. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean that's a. But, but here I want to be a, a, a bit more precise because I think okay. um, in the case of you know Presti's book and and, and Alan Wallace also uh, you know makes this argument too. Um, there, the the idea of enlarging the dialogue often takes the form of, of, okay, well, we want to talk about these, for example, you know, paranormal phenomena that scientists just uh, don't typically think about or that they, you know, um, don't want to think about. But that's still – that's not quite what I had in mind because there – the, the playing field on which those ideas are being put forward is still very much, well, um, what if there is scientific evidence or how could we scientifically validate them? And, and, and there I think actually scientists generally do have a good response, which is to say, well, look, we don't dismiss those things out of, out of hand a priori. It's just that we don't actually think by our present scientific lights that um, that those things uh, you know merit the kind of standing that you're that you're giving to them. So that in a way devolves the conversation back into being about science. Whereas what I'm talking about is a little different. It's more that so the example you know examples that I would use are things like um, science is a human practice, and many of our discoveries in science depend on instrumentalizing our relationship to other sentient beings through animal yeah, experiments. Yeah, like killing al- animals. Yeah, and animal, killing animals. Exactly, <laughs> right. And, you know, we we have reasons why um, we think it's ethically necessary to do this. But now a full conversation would require that we not take that for granted and that we actually step back and think, well, wait a minute. Um, you know, science is a particular way of relating to the world um, that aims to, you know, manipulate it and control it. And that's 
sure, we're in a pandemic right now and we we want science to try to come up with a vaccine. So that's like part of manipulating and controlling things. But at the same time, you know, there might be other ways of doing science that would come about through, you know, uh, an ethical, a, a larger ethical framework. And so that's more what I have in mind. Um, when uh, I yeah. Well, you, you make some really beautiful statements here. I'll read a few of them. You, you talk about... Um, Viewing science or maybe a new form of science as a form of uh, personally transformative contemplation. And uh, you talk about the fundamental difference in motivation between Buddhism and science. And that's where we come into the realm of uh, the ethics of knowledge that we just, uh, I think you're mentioning now. Right. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. And and I think, um, you know, if you... So, 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 go ahead. No, that's fine. That's fine. Go ahead. So, can you... Can you, in a, I know it's hard to wrap it up in a, a short amount of time, but your last chapter, can you give us, um, you know, you talk of, you, you, you argue that Buddhist modernism basically distorts the significance of the Buddhist tradition. Uh, so what in your view is the significance of the Buddhist tradition to the modern world, given this cosmopolitan framework that you're, uh, that you're, uh, you're, you're creating? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, what I have in mind there, I mean, I wouldn't want to be sort of reductive about it and say, you know, the significance is X as if it's, you know, as if it's just... No, that's, I know it's an unfair question, perhaps. <laughs> but, but, I mean, what I have in mind is that there is, that there is a, a, a rich um, philosophical, intellectual tradition over millennia in, you know, many different cultures in Buddhism, and that that tradition thinking with that tradition would call into question many of the either you could say scientific or kind of irrational romanticist ideas that are so strongly operative in buddhist modernism so my 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 idea is that um buddhism has its own rich intellectual resources that can be brought to bear for thinking itself through and beyond um, Buddhist modernism. And, and those are um, – those philosophical resources span a, a range of topics, you know, from things having to do with um, calling into question, you know, reificatory ways of thinking or ways of thinking that sort of instrumentalize our relationship to ourselves and the natural world or the social world or ways of thinking that are fundamentally about ethics and um, – altruism, compassion. That's that's really what I have in mind there. And so, I mean, of course, I'm a philosopher, so I'm naturally going to be drawn to those things and I'm, and I'm going to want to emphasize them. But I see them as important to emphasize in this, what I call cosmopolitan context of, you know, the world's intellectual philosophical traditions. Because if, if Buddhism is is going to, you know, take its rightful place in that conversation, then I think it, it, is going to be through the the richness of its philosophical intellectual tradition that is that is going to be able to do that. Well, that's great. Well, uh, maybe we'll uh, call it a day. And uh, I really enjoyed this conversation with you, you. Uh, Evan. Evan Thompson is a professor of philosophy at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. He writes about the mind, life, consciousness, and the self from the perspectives of cognitive science, philosophy of mind, phenomenology, and the cross-cultural philosophy, especially Buddhism and other Indian philosophical traditions. As a teenager, Evan was homeschooled in Southampton, New York, and Manhattan at the Lindisfarne Association, an educational and contemplative community founded by his parents, William Irvin Thompson and Gail Thompson. He received his bachelor's degree in Asian studies from Amherst College, studying with Robert Thurman, and his doctorate in philosophy from the University of Toronto. We spoke today with Evan about his new book, Why I Am Not a Buddhist, published by Yale University Press in 2020. 
And he is also the author of Waking, Dreaming, and Being, Self and Consciousness in Neuroscience, Meditation and Philosophy, published by Columbia University Press, and also co-author with Francisco Varela and Eleanor Roche of The Embodied Mind, Cognitive Science and Human Experience, first published by MIT Press in 1991 and in revised edition in 2016. Thank you for listening to The Mindful Cranks. Please review us on iTunes if you get a chance. Check out our Facebook and Twitter, along with our website, mindfulcranks.com.